Mayo. Mm -hmm. Mayo. Mm -hmm. All right. Jean Mio from UC Davis uh, is the UC Cooperative Extension Farm Advisor. He focuses on vegetable crops and the impacts of drip and tomato for growers, the economics, product, and for growers, including economics and productivity. The vegetable crops program that Gene oversees fosters appropriate research and collects and disseminates relevant information to growers, processors, and related industries in the California vegetable industry. Gene's areas of research include local variety adaptation, trial valuations, local disease management strategies and practices. Most of the research is conducted in commercial fields in cooperation with growers and is often collaborative with UC specialists. Thanks, Gene. Thank you. So um, I'm a, a local uh, extension uh, advisor uh, in the Woodland office uh, covering a couple of counties. Uh, this is a presentation on uh, processing tomatoes. The, uh, the file really is uh, from Tim Hartz and Tim's in the, in the back there. Uh, so, I, I'm pretty much giving uh, t Tim's presentation, so if Tim has some comments, uh, he can certainly chime in. So, um, I think the story for canning tomatoes is, uh, is a good one. Uh, that yields have gone up over the years, water use uh, really hasn't. And so, water use efficiency um, is, is sort of the driver. It's, uh, it's been... Uh, uh, more tomatoes per drop of water. So if we look at the California tomato industry, uh, it's, it's really grown over the years. Uh, it was about a 2 million ton uh, industry, or 3 million tons uh, back in the 60s. It's been uh, just a, sort of a, uh, uh, now up to about uh, 14 million tons. It's dropped back a bit uh, to be uh, about a 12 million ton annual production. Uh, because of uh, oversupply worldwide, uh, and so there's a, uh, I think maybe it's stable around 12 to 13 million tons or, or so. Um, uh, and in California, we're producing uh, something 90% or 95% of the U.S. production and about a, a third or so of the world production. And nearly all of it uh, has pulled back into the Central Valley as in uh, into the, uh, I guess in the 70s and, and 80s, there was, and, and earlier, there was uh, some production in the Imperial Valley in the very southern end of California, uh, in California uh, for the early production, and then a lot of coastal uh, production areas, including uh, sort of our, our central coast. But that, uh, while there's a little bit of production remaining there, is really very much uh, Central Valley oriented and uh, the biggest uh, producing areas down in the Fresno, Kern County, in the west side uh, of, uh, of Fresno. Okay, if we looked at the industry kind of traditionally, it had historically been furrow irrigated oriented. Uh, sprinklers to start with, some in some cases, sprinkle irrigated season long. Sprinklers uh, oftentimes, on the, especially on the west side, pre irrigated uh, uh, with these you know, hand line move systems. It has, uh, it has certainly uh, developed into using much more drip irrigation and, uh, and has become subsurface drip irrigated with, uh, with this drip tape. Um, why, why this uh, sort of movement into uh, drip irrigation? Say, uh, for, for myself, uh, I thought in the Sacramento Valley, I started in the 1980s and uh, I thought for our Sacramento Valley, where we had plenty of uh, water, uh, we thought, and it was uh, relatively cheap, that I thought that I would uh, make it through my extension career without seeing very much, I mean, a limited amount, but not very much uh, drip irrigation being used uh, uh, in the north. Uh, very wrong. And clearly what happened in those early days, there were some innovative growers in our area, and they, they uh, were looking at uh, drip irrigation, uh, the tape with some of the Netafim stuff that was a uh, hard walled uh, plastic. And uh, uh, a lot of the connections though with the uh, delivering of water, uh, I looked at some of those systems and there were a lot of leaks in the field. Just the engineering of the system, I'd say uh, was, um, maybe that would be too uh, uh, brutal to say it was primitive, but there, were a lot of, there was a lot of uh, water running everywhere except 
into that uh, into that crop. And so I thought, wow, well, my gosh, this is uh, this is uh, not going to be very successful. Well, if we looked at uh, then uh, the yields, uh, and I'd say this is this can be very. Uh, I'd say uh, looking at it that it's been driven both uh, for yields have been driven by genetics, variety improvement, but also this drip irrigation system. So if we looked at uh, this, uh, the yields, they've just gone up. Uh, this is an average uh, across the years for California. And we see yields uh, back in, uh, in the, uh, the 1990s or so being uh, uh, 30 tons or so, and then just continue to increase. And so we can look at this timeline and look at it uh, as when uh, drip uh, really uh, became much more prominent. And we can see that yields have you know, increased uh, in, along with this timeline when drip was uh, uh, being uh, more widely used. And so if we look at this, uh, this sort of this metric of uh, how many acres of tomatoes are being, uh, being planted, you know, it's, there, while there's ups and downs, uh, depending on the year, it's, it's, it's relatively stable. It's, and I'd say that uh, uh, it is, uh, has decreased because our yields have gone, gone up. And that's what we're seeing here, that yields have just gone up. And it's almost a, a linear rise in yields from, uh, I'd say, 20 tons back in the 60s uh, and, and now approaching uh, 50 tons. And it'll clear that 50 ton mark, although our genetics and the varieties, even the old varieties, it is 100 tons per acre. The genetics are there to clearly produce 100 tons per acre. And I was a, a young advisor when I went to, uh, uh, and I came from Davis, but we looked at an uh, experiment on, uh, on the Fresno State uh, University Research Facility and an individual, uh, uh, there showed us his uh, plots. They were it was drip, drip irrigated, subsurface drip. It was uh, controlled by a little, I guess, uh, a little sensor, and that he was uh, irrigating every time that soil moisture dropped a little bit. This microsensor would <coughs> click on the the water. It was an old variety, a small vine variety, a uh, university developed variety. It was UC82, very small vine, but concentrated fruit set and. Uh, we were able to see in those days when average yields were back in uh, about uh, 35 tons or so, maybe 30 tons, and this was a 100 ton yielding crop, 100 tons on an old, old variety. And so it really opened people's eyes, opened our eyes in terms of for myself to saying that there were strategies during, during the, the growing season when growers, when these very proficient high yielding growers were talking about water stressing during full bloom so that, uh, or, or very much sort of a, a vegetative stage, you get these, these plants to become more fruitful. So showing the idea of a sort of a looking at weeds and saying when they became water stressed, that, that those weed plants would then be, want to set seed and become more fruitful. And uh, with this drip irrigation experiment on, on Fresno State, <coughs> It showed me, at least, that uh, you know, full-on watering, keep, keep that uh, 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 water, that plant fully watered, you know, matching ET made the most sense, brought our yields up. And that's, I think, what's happened with, uh, with our drip, better uniformly distributed water. And here, this is an experiment, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of charts there, but uh, basically what it said to me, this uh, uh, experiment uh, uh, for several years run by an irrigation specialist, uh, uh, Blaine Hansen and Don May, an advisor down in Fresno, that had, uh, those two had worked with drip irrigation early on. And what it said was that in the early days, when yields were, let's say, 35 tons per acre, that water use did not change to, to make this a 50-ton crop. The same amount of water, the same ET rates were needed, whether it was a lower yielding or higher yielding. It didn't make that difference. So we're getting increased uh, water use efficiency out of this system uh, with, this, with this drip tape. Okay, and, and here's uh, uh, Tim Hartz, who did a survey, apparently, of uh, growers uh, in California. And it, the, the red dots are looking at furrow irrigation and the blue dots with drip irrigated systems. 
And what I, I'd say the, the bottom line for me is this, that when we look at these high yields, yields on this axis, and water use in inches per ton of fruit, so that metric, what we can see, I'd say for myself, is that these high yields are very concentrated, uh, but not, I mean, there's outliers too, or there's different examples, but the, the bulk of it is occurring right in here. So high yields, reduced water use, because in terms of that metric of tons produced per inch of water. And we can see that, uh, you know, in the case of, uh, of the furrow systems, much more variable. And we see that, of course, with uh, furrow irrigation systems, the traditional systems, that there's, there's water that's leaving the field. It's uh, that thing that uh, uh, Dan Putnam talked about, you know, with flood irrigation, although this, in this case, uh, tomatoes is not totally flooded, it's, it's channeled in furrows, but there, there needs to be some wastewater there to get a uniform uh, ir uh, soil moisture, at least into the lower part of the field. So there's inefficiencies involved. In terms of uh, nitrogen, uh, people talked about, you know, with the water, uh, what's happening with the nitrogen. I'd say uh, that thing that uh, Will Horowath, his experiment showing that uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, the subsurface drip irrigation has reduced uh, those uh, uh, emissions. If we look again at uh, some Tim Hartz uh, and others' uh, uh, information, you can see that in terms of that metric about uh, 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 the nitrogen balance, that in the case of, uh, uh, of tomatoes and in these uh, 20 fields or so, that most of them are, uh, the nitrogen balance is, is, uh, is very good, that it's, you know, they're not uh, overusing uh, fertilizer and a bunch of that uh, nitrogen is, is taken away in the fruit itself. So probably a good story, can be improved, but a good story with uh, the canning tomato industry and, and uh, nitrogen use. So are there some other challenges there? Here, yes, are there are some complications. Uh, uh, yes, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, others have presented information. If we looked at uh, cost of the system, I think our numbers are a little different than Dan's, uh, Putnam's, but uh, there's less strip tape uh, in, the, in the tomato field. Uh, and for this annual crop that, uh, at least in our Central Valley, for the most part, that uh, tomatoes are a driver for drip irrigation in our annual crops. That other crops follow the tomatoes in the rotation, take advantage of the drip tape, uh, but uh, tomatoes are the driver. About $1,000 per acre, $300 or so are, are in the uh, investment into this uh, drip tape. Uh, it's changed land rental agreements. Uh, for us in the Sacramento Valley, growers are, are partly landowners, but uh, uh, the bulk of the land tends to be rented ground, non-owned, but rented ground. And therefore, the, the leases have to be extended in order to pay for those type of investments. So it's an agreement with the landowner in this case. And uh, uh, others have talked about uh, increased energy costs with uh, compared to a gravity system because it needs to be pressurized. And so these, these systems are pressurized uh, to, to have the I don't know, 10, 10, 12 pounds down uh, into that uh, drip tape. And, and there's been interest uh, in getting a system that requires lower pressure uh, to save energy with, uh, with the drip system. Whether that can be developed uh, successfully and have good uniformity, I think remains the, remains the challenge. Um, and then what it's also done is that for growers, for the most part, even in the Sacramento Valley, that these systems, growers would prefer them to be on, on groundwater, on a well where they're controlling the, the on-off switch. Okay? But uh, the price of that, that well is considerable, and some of these ones are, are a, a $200,000 investment into a you know, into developing a well and having a motor on top of that. In terms of labor, uh, I'd say it's been more of a, when we uh, survey growers, it's been more of a, a sort of an even trade, that uh, it hasn't been so much of a, of a labor savings on irrigation. 
But what it's done is it's changed uh, how irrigation is done and how it's being managed so that there's a manager controlling the hours of runtime. That is, seems to be the most important thing. The rest of the labor is ter perhaps turning on manually valves. There's some automated valve systems. Uh, but in our Sacramento Valley, it's been tending to be more manually operated with some, uh, some bit of, uh, of automation involved there. But uh, a lot of this labor is, just as Dan has talked about, uh, it's fixing these uh, leaks. And the leaks are, are primarily uh, driven by rodents. So you know, having uh, a tape, uh, growers have gone to thicker tape at a greater expense, but uh, uh, rodents, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not the answer. You know, you can have some pretty thick tape there, and, and rodents will, uh, uh, as Dan talked about, recre recreationally uh, indulge. So, um, weed competition, great reduction there. So, with subsurface drip irrigation, great reduction in, in weed competition. Not eliminated it, but reduced it. Uh, in terms of then uh, other changes, uh, changing the annual cropping pattern for, I think for us in the Central Valley, uh, I'm gonna, uh, shed, I will shed a tear over that, but we're seeing so much uh, almonds and other orchard crops uh, displacing a lot of the uh, annual crops here. So what it's done is intensified the crop rotation, especially to tomatoes, uh, the cost of investment as well as uh, available land left over for annual crops has really intensified the number of, of tomatoes in a given period. So that presents other challenges for us as well. Um, we talk about uh, divergent bed widths. People are uh, playing with that. Primarily, I'd say it's not so much tomato driven as it is uh, rotational driven, that there's uh, um, you know, other crops that uh, would fit better on a, a different bed configuration. Melons uh, is one example of that. And, and as Dan has talked about, uh, in terms of for tomatoes, a single drip line would be sufficient for a five foot bed or a, an 80 inch wide bed. I don't know what the metric, uh, the metric uh, measurement of that would be, but I'm not turning to Dan for that answer. <laughs> Uh, but so a single drip tape would be sufficient, but these alternate <coughs> rotational crops, then uh, you know, it, it, it needs to fit into the system. And so that's, I think that was the, the last uh, uh, slide for me. The, the summary of it is for tomatoes, uh, you know, water use efficiency has clearly gone up. And we think that yields will continue to rise both because of genetics and continued use of drip irrigation. I'd say that um, you know, we've seen uh, especially uh, uh, soil types that have not been, uh, traditionally have not been high uh, tomato producers, that uh, the drip use of uh, drip irrigation has controlled the moisture management much better and has brought up the yields in, in those fields. So um, um, it, it's been a, it, it's, uh, it, it's been a win-win for, uh, for, for us. Uh, are there some losers? And, and sure, that, that is the case. There's, uh, you know, uh, it's a high investment. And so, you know, are, are all growers able to invest? E even those growers who might have been in the day have been, uh, 1,500 acre tomato growers that uh, when there were a question asking why, if, if drip irrigation is so good in raising yields, why wouldn't you put uh, all, your, all your farm, your entire farm into uh, in your entire tomato farm under a subsurface strip? And you're saying, well, you know, the cost, we, 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 we just can't manage that expense all at once. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, thanks. <laughs>